Dr. Mike Divan. Thank you. It's, it's a great personal honor for me uh, uh, to represent um, a sister institute to um, ICRISAT, John Innes Center. We've got many collaborations uh, over many years and a, and a common objective. But for me also, this is a bit of a personal journey because um, about 40 years ago, when I was much younger, um, I came through India on my way to graduate school. And um, when I was in India, I saw so many marvelous things that have stayed with me all of my life. This is one of them. You might recognize this, Mount Kachanjunga, looming over the border of India in Nepal. I didn't take this photograph, of course. Uh, um, it, it comes courtesy of, of Google Images. But um, walking over the, over the highest hills in, in West Bengal and waking up one morning to see the clouds reveal such majesty has stayed with me all my life. And uh, it's so excellent to be back in India as a fully formed professional scientist to talk about uh, work that we're doing. Now, Aaron gave an outstanding presentation. Um, his, 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 his methods have revolutionized, uh, of course, human genomics, but also uh, uh, through, through his engagement, uh, crop genomics. I want to tell you uh, uh, today uh, in my talk about um, just one species of, of plant, that is uh, bread wheat. Bread wheat has got a very interesting ancestry, as you know, but I, I like to uh, you probably all know it, but um, I'll, I'll just repeat it. Um, and in some respects, uh, the previous large mountain uh, is a great metaphor for, for this uh, very large and complicated genome. So here is bread wheat. Um, it is a hexaploid that was formed between A and B and D genomes uh, in historic times, about 8,000 years ago, they think. Um, somewhere in the South Caspian Basin of what is now Iran. It, uh, it, it, it's uh, uh, progenitor genomes, the A and the B genomes, uh, all, and D genome, all diversified from a common Triticea ancestor about six and a half million years ago. These uh, formed originally a D genome. Later, they formed uh, 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 the A and B tetraploid about 800,000 years ago. This has then been domesticated, shown by the green arrows, to form pasta wheat. This is domesticated uh, over a similar time frame <clears throat> to form bread wheat. Other useful members of the Triticea family, uh, uh, which are diploids, include barley and rye. So this represents uh, uh, a very interesting problem in genome and assembly. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, how this has been going. How this has been going. Um, but one of the key things of polyploidy in plants is that it gives rise to new traits relatively quickly. And, and a big problem, an, an exciting problem in biology, is understanding how these traits can arise so quickly upon polyploidization. Let me just give you one example, a critically important example. In ancestral wheats, um, the grain, the nutritious grain, is held in a hard husk. And that hard husk falls off the central spike very, very easily. Um, our ancestors used to eat these grains. And their teeth would get worn down by the silica content of the husk, and they would die uh, of starvation when they no longer had any teeth to eat these hard grains. Upon polyploidization at the Q locus, um, you got this free threshing uh, phenotype in which the grains would stay on the central stalk, but the hulls around the grains were very light and fluffy and they would blow off to form the chaff. Now, these are the three genes at the Q locus. These are AP2-like transcription factors. Um, one of them is a pseudogene on the 5B, 5B chromosome. 5D looks like a, a reasonably functional gene, but the expression of the 5A, expression at the 5A locus was, um, uh, uh, was reduced by a microRNA that target, targets uh, uh, it for reduced expression. So somehow there are subtle differences in the expression levels and location of expression of these genes that um, uh, 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 makes a, a free threshing grain. And here you can see uh, 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 the old way and the new way of threshing grains. <clears throat> now, 
been comprised of three relatively large genomes. Um, the wheat genome um, is rather large to work with. Latest results from Steve Salzberg's lab says that maybe 17 gigabases, which was an estimate based on uh, 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 foilgen staining, may be too, too great. It may be uh, uh, 15 gigabases. But still, that's an enormous genome, comprised, as I've said, of three very closely related genomes. Those last common ancestor is between four to six million years ago. And the genomes are large because they are full of repeats. This just gives you an example uh, of a, a genome of a small grass, a, a small grass genome, Brachypodium, only 240 megabases. And here you can see the, the repeats shown by these blue, uh, uh, blue, blue, blue peaks here, uh, 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 relatively low and confined to the paracentromeric region. If you look at a, a, an assembled chromosome of sorghum, um, that, which is much bigger, you can see it's much bigger because the extensive ex uh, uh, repeat expansion in this region. And you can see here, here is a weak carrier type compared to human, uh, compared, to, compared to Arabidopsis. Now, <clears throat> when we started to sequence wheat, we, we, we work at the John Innes and, and our partner institutes in a, in a context that we want to use genomics for, for, for wheat improvement and to understand wheat biology. So we needed to be able to identify the types of genetic variation that you find in wheat. So SNPs are, are, are reasonably easy to find just by aligning even a single Illumina read, although it's got to be reasonably deep, to, um, uh, to identify a single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, small insertions and deletions, similarly, you can, you can, you can, you can detect them by uh, relating uh, a sequence read um, to, to reference. But other sorts of variation, copy number variation, Structural, vari structural variation, small scale, uh, and large integrations and translocations, which happen uh, a lot during wheat breeding and during uh, uh, wheat evolution. You just can't find those by aligning to a reference. And finally, haplotype phasing, that is the inherited order of a conserved set of sequence polymorphisms. Uh, you, you, you cannot determine uh, at all by aligning to a reference. You need a de novo assembly uh, for these. So we've set out to um, not to get perfect assemblies, but now I understand how, how we can do that, but to get sequence that's good enough to do this job. The technologies that um, we've used are primarily uh, Illumina high seat sequencing. And we've used PacBio a lot, but that is for identifying genes. To, uh, to use ISO-seq to sequence full-length um, full RNA molecules. We're now deeply involved in using uh, 10x chromium-linked reads, which I'll, I'll describe later to anybody who, who's, who's interested in that extraordinarily powerful technology. And finally, we're starting to use nanopore sequencing to, um, to, to uh, generate long reads uh, for, for generating larger scaffolds. So, this table shows the, the progress that we've made in, in sequencing uh, 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 elite wheat lines, primarily UK wheat lines, because that's what we're funded to do. So we uh, published uh, a, a reference uh, sequence of Chinese spring um, early, earlier this year. This has already been supplanted by other that much better, more contiguous assemblies. We've sequenced uh, these varieties here. I'll just go through why we've done it. We've sequenced a variety called Cadenza. It's an elite variety. It's the parent of many UK, Northern European wheat varieties. And it is a, a functional genomic standard. This has got the EMS tilling mutation in it. We've sequenced the variety Paragon. This uh, it also has got important functional genomics resources in terms of X-ray induced chromosomal deletions. Um, and it's also the parent of multiple um, NAM and real population for QTL analysis. We've sequenced uh, tetraploid chronos, mainly for practice, uh, but that is also an important, an important line. And it's the functional genomics resource for, for, um, uh, uh, for, for tetraploid wheat. 
Uh, these two lions here, Robigus and Claire, UK winter wheats are also the parents of uh, uh, important UK varieties. So between Cadenza, Robigus and Claire, these are the parents of about 70% of the current UK and uh, 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 elite lions that are grown in the field. And down here, we're busy sequencing um, these lines here, these are uh, the parents of a magic cross, uh, uh, a magic cross that is multiple crosses are made between parents uh, for QTL analyses. These uh, assemblies are going on at the moment. And down here, in collaboration with CIMIT, we are sequencing uh, uh, three varieties important to them. Munal, Kachu, which I, judging by their names, are grown here in India. Um, they are, uh, have got import drought resistance characteristics, and Weebill is a source of some very good germplasm. So we are gradually filling up the box along here. And, and actually, when it, when, when it comes down to it, the, the hardest thing is the annotation. Um, that is uh, handcrafted human, uh, human work. And I just want to get on to the way we uh, annotated uh, the wheat genome. The wheat genome, it's got lots of genes in it, lots of very, very closely related genes. But it's also got a massive number of genes that are not quite genes. The odd little stop codon, the odd splicing error, for example, that need to be identified uh, with reasonably high precision. Otherwise, all the subsequent biology that you and others will be doing will be, will be strongly compromised. Uh, we, I mean David Swarbrick and his team at the Earlham Institute, uh, did, have done a fantastic job of annotating wheat, and now they're annotating the NR genome, which will be the, the um, gold standard, if you like, of, of wheat for, for the foreseeable future. Basically, um, what we've done uh, to find genes is to use deep sequencing of alumina of the transcriptome of 63 different tissues and time courses, and uh, of PacBio sequencing. The PacBio IsoSeq generates full-length sequence of, of, of uh, cDNAs, and this has uh, been proved to be extremely important in identifying correctly expressed genes. And this just shows you uh, the genes that can be fully reconstructed are colored in red. So here you can see the very important contribution of long reads on doing this. So uh, just very quickly here, uh, compared to previous annotations, we found 40% of 40% uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of our annotations were missing in previous ones. 25% were structurally different. Ours uh, contained 13% of their genes, but ours were much longer. And the only ones that were identical were 22%. So this is a significant ad advance in the annotation of the genomes. So just to give you some numbers, there are 104,000 genes. This is probably going to be a bit bigger, maybe up to 110,000 in the NR gene assembly, I understand. Here you can see there are uh, uh, what we call low confidence protein coding genes. There are 83,000 of these that have to be uh, distinguished quite precisely from true protein coding genes. And we believe we've made a good start on that. The other sorts of changes, so after, after annotation, we started to look at large-scale structural changes in the wheat genome. Here you can see um, uh, from Asaf Distelfeld's group um, a published sequence of, uh, of, of wild Emma wheat, uh, tetraploid. And here you can see in these green, I don't see these pale green loops here, show uh, known translocations that have occurred at some <coughs> stage during uh, uh, the um, the, the evolution and domestication of, of, this, of these genomes. So here you can see relatively few uh, of these translocations in the, in the tetraploid. In the hexaploid, there are many, many translocations. These are large translocations, multi-megabase multi regions found in one chromosome, um, but not in another. Some of them are duplications. There are deletions as well. So the known translocations previously known before we sequenced to these gold things. And we discovered the green and the blue ones were new translocations. So the hexaploid genome here is riddled with uh, translocations, large multi-megabase regions that we need to accurately capture when we sequence and assemble uh, wheat varieties. 
Uh, a key issue for us in our program was because we were uh, uh, using, well, we used the best available methods to distinguish uh, and to separate the assemblies of very closely related genes using um, non-amplified, um, you know, discovar type uh, 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 reads uh, and contigging that fully respected as much as possible the subtle differences between each genome. But nevertheless, we wanted to find out how good our and others' assemblies were. So for that, we generated a library of, uh, of, of fossils, which are basically 40 KB, approximately 40 KB inserts. This shows you the uh, insert variation in the fossil libraries, showing they're being correctly packaged. And when we mapped the fossils to chromosome uh, uh, 3B, you could see that there was a reasonable, there was a, a complete coverage. These spikes here are where there are 40 KB, uh, at least 40 KB regions in the wheat genome that uh, were common between uh, different, uh, different chromosomes. So therefore, you've got a higher copy number. So you, uh, as is being used by Evan Eichler and his colleague, other, other colleagues in improving the assembly of the wheat genome, you can use the, the mate pair mapping of these precisely uh, uh, separated uh, pairs of reads to find consistent reads. So you, we, you run your fossils at a, at, a, at, a, at a reasonable read depth. So this is about 1x sequence depth up here uh, across a genome. And when, you, when this matches with its uh, uh, following uh, uh, pair uh, by around about 37 KBs, it's a consistent match. If the span expands, it, there must be an, inser, an incorrect insertion. And if it's contracted, there must be an incorrect deletion. So you can also make new joins. You can identify failed scaffolds and misorientation. Sorry, your, your, your fossil length is um, not, uh, not uh, in, in the correct orientation. So to have a, a, a long story short, we carried out this analysis on a a couple of chromosomes. We chose 3B because that has got a published back sequence. So here we've compared back assemblies, our assembly, the Salzburg Triticum 3.0 pack bio-based assembly, and the De Novo Magic 2 assembly of wild Emma wheat that has been that has been published. But to cut a long story short, the NR gene assembly um, is uh, of wild Emma wheat chromosome is as good as the human genome back in 2005, which I think is pretty good for a wheat genome. It is very, the sequence, the underlying sequence is very accurate because it's done with deep voluminous sequencing and uh, uh, the long range contiguity is very good. There are, of course, errors, but there always are. Uh, the assembly wheat is as accurate, but because it's fragmented, uh, it's not really good. But where we do have long uh, uh, scaffolds in the TGAC assembly, these are all uh, as accurate as the NRG assembly. So this is big kudos to the Illumina-based approach to sequencing wheat. Interestingly, the packed bio-based assemblies are not as good, uh, not as accurate. They contain more inversions and incorrect assemblies than the Illumina-based assemblies but they are reasonably contiguous and they incorporate more sequence into the final wheat assembly. And finally, back-based assemblies where you break your DNA into chunks and then try to reassemble it uh, is, a, is a veritable genomic nightmare. This just shows you some of the areas that we, types of areas that we've identified. So on chromosome 3B, uh, there were two scaffolds here that were put at the opposite ends of the pseudomolecule. Our, uh, phosmid matches show that these actually belong together at one of these locations. And another one here, there is a TGAC version one uh, 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 scaffold, um, which the fossil has a greater than 50 KB span. That means that there is an incorrect um, uh, insertion in that assembly. And here you can see the same region from the PAC bio assembly has got a 37 KB span confirming this error. We've then used the fossils to substantially improve the scaffolding of our uh, assemblies, but probably they're still not quite big enough to get into the one megabase range needed for high C. So we're making progress in trying to get as good a weak sequence as possible uh, 
for a minimum amount of funding. But now, uh, in, in the remaining five minutes, I want to tell you about our work in which we're using something called skim sequencing to access sequence diversity in populations of wheat and in, uh, in genetically structured populations and in uh, wild relatives. Skim sequencing is very simple. Um, what you do, you, you sequence 384 genomes at once, and you do 384 um, uh, 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 light react, so-called so light reaction with an Xterra treatment to fragment the DNA in a in a in a multi well uh, in a multi well format uh, with uh, multiple paired barcodes to separate the samples upon uh, upon Illumina. So skim sequencing works very well, um, and you can tune it. We use between 0.1 and 1x at the moment. Uh, to get a, a first view of sequence diversity in, in the wheat vines that we're working on. So, for example, we've sequenced 94 of core land races. These represent the diversity of wheat before commercial um, uh, 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 domestication, uh, before commercial breeding. So these are domesticated wheats that are adapted to local environments, many of them from India, in fact, um, and, but uh, they have not yet been touched by commercial breeding. And also populations for QTL mapping. We're, skim we are now s sequencing 118 lines uh, from breeders pedigrees in the UK. I'll tell you why we're doing that. Uh, F4 magic populations are being sequenced. Wild relatives. My colleague um, uh, uh, Brenda Wolf has de novo assembled 120 Eglops tauchii lines to identify disease resistance genes. And in we're exploring together with Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences genetic differences between, between European and Chinese uh, wheats because there is a big difference, 6,000 years of independent um, domestication. This just shows you what happens to the uh, uh, gene pool of wheat as you go from uh, the, uh, the land races that have been collected uh, um, back, uh, back in the early 20s. This represents their genetic, the height represents their gen genetic diversity. These have been taken through into um, uh, things that have been phenotyped in the field. These have then been QTL'd uh, uh, by mapping in, in the background paradigm, which has been sequenced. And from these, we're identifying QTL's and markers, fairly precise markers, that can then go into the modern breeder's toolkit. This is the work of of um, Simon Griffiths, but we're first interested in what, what, what when, when breeders monkey around with wheat genomes, what do, they, what do their products actually look like? So this is the chromosomal haplotypes of XI19. It's a, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very simple variety. Uh, it's a cross between Cadenza and Rialto wheat, and this is the result of mapping 0.1x Illumina sequence along um, the, using the NR gene as a, as a, as a, as a chromosomal scaffold. So here, here, here you see, uh, here, here you see um, like group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group seven, etc. And here you can see the haplotypes that make, this, uh, make, make up this wheat variety. In fact, some chromosomes, uh, uh, 6D here, are uh, almost entirely uh, cadenza. Uh, some of them are almost entirely Rialto. As you can see, recombination points along here, and when you look in a bit more detail, just just to show you how the how the how the how the method works, this is the read this is the read depth here, or a signal or a, a representation of the read depth in one megabase windows. Uh, as you as you go along, you can see the sequence goes uh, 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 high red, high red, high red, low red, blue along there. Uh, uh, red, red, high red, high red. But the blue sequence jumps around a bit, and over here, your 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 high blue and low red. So you just map in one megabase windows the reads because you've sequenced the parents, sequenced and assembled the parents. You know which reads belong to which uh, which genome. This is just another example of um, of, of some. Uh, just the start of sequence, skim sequencing the population of about 800. Um, or, yep, and gotcha. 
um, uh, sequencing a population of uh, X-ray induced uh, deletions in, in the Paragon genome. Here you can see uh, regions where read, read, uh, read depth is lower than expected. Just to show you what this looks like in higher, higher up here, you can see quite a large deletion of one chromosome. Here's another deletion. And here, it, this looks like a, um, a, 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 a copy number. This just shows you why we're sequencing these varieties. We have full assembled sequence of these varieties. These are their progeny. These are all of the elite wheat line pedigrees uh, that are currently used to generate um, UK breeding lines. And we're skim sequencing all of these. So we can look to get haplotype maps of all of them. I won't, don't have time to go into this, but we, we published this sort of notional idea that you can then, with this information, give breeders uh, 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 keys, uh, key, key information such as the uh, 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 markers establishing the haplotypes uh, to be able to assemble desired haplotypes based on their phenotypes. And I have to say, going back, uh, all of these lines have been phenotyped uh, for breeding characteristics uh, uh, in the field over many years. Finally, I just want to add uh, uh, a thank you, an acknowledgement to some outstanding colleagues. Uh, Matt Clark, who is a sequencing guru, developed these methods. Christopher Wawi, Simon Griffiths, excellent wheat geneticist, as is Samia Krasaleva. Brenda Wolf did the um, doing work on uh, Tausi. I didn't have time to, work to tell you, so we're doing all this genotype work in wheat. We're now doing precision phenotyping in the field using uh, remote sensing that's led by Jizu. So I'm sorry to run over time, and thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Very quick. <laughs> I see two hands at the same time. <laughs> okay, one by one, please. Uh, you mentioned translocations and inversions. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, did you see translocations from other species? We know there are a lot of translocations from rye, for instance. Yes. Are there translocations from others like agropyron? Mm -hmm. And what about um, synthetic wheat? So if you sequence synthetic wheat, as we know from, uh, from uh, oilseed rape, which is also a polyploid, yeah. you see a, a very quick rearrangement of the yeah. genome just yeah. after the synthesis. Do you yeah. observe similar? So, yeah, so, some of these varieties, I, 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 for, I forget which, I haven't been working in wheat that long. Some of these varieties have got rye translocations on one of their, one of their uh, chromosome arms, and you can easily detect that. Your signal, because rye is so divergent, your signal goes right down. You don't detect it. And similarly with other integrations from agropyron species and others, the method is easily able to identify these uh, as, a lack of a, as a lack of a signal of a sequenced tweet. Yeah. So uh, the, thank you, Mike. Um, your statement that back-based assemblies are very error-prone, is it true only for wheat or for other crops? Is it a generalized statement? And in that case, if for wheat, does that mean that the physical maps we are generating in wheat for the individual chromosomes, that's not a right strategy? This is, I, I have to be frank with you. You heard in the previous talk that things like high C, chromosome chromosomes, can give you beautiful long range. We, all, we have all spent hours, years in the trenches doing, um, making backs, assembling. Uh, that was the only thing we had. But now, for, for sequencing any crop genome, I think a back-based strategy and a physical mapping-based strategy should now be put to one side. They're very incredibly expensive, and they're not very accurate on compared to what Aaron and his colleagues have made and compared with what we have been able to do with Illumina sequencing. So that's bad news, I'm afraid. The last question from Eris Eden. Hey, could you flip back to your slide? I don't know if you can actually get yeah. back to this, but, but maybe I'll just ask you verbally. Where are the scaffold, what's the scaffold on 50 now for your, for your best de novo weeds? Well, the NR genes, you mean the yeah. NR gene or, or, or our ones? Oh, oh, yeah, or, or I mean, oh. the, the, yours. Oh, oh uh, it, yes, that was around, around about 400, 500 KBs and 50. 
Yeah, so you mentioned in your talk that you, you thought that those were actually too short, but I'm, I'm actually quite confident that those are actually, could be assembled for the most part into chromosome length scaffolds that's, uh, that's, from where they are, and yeah. I, would, I would love to follow up on I, that. I, I, we got that, because I know you, you, you're working on, on the hexaploid wheat with um, Nils and Martin Masher and so on. And in the early days where we spoke about this, maybe a year ago, they said you have to have, get up to one megabase N50 before your method could kick in accurately. Yeah, so that's just not the case, right? I mean, the stuff that I'm showing you here, in the case of uh, 80s gypti you're talking about, you know, I mean, we can start with 50 KB even, uh, scaffold and 50s. So that, that's a critical thing because you can't really get to megabase long scaffolds from short reads. Yeah. If you're operating from short reads, you have to be able to work with like 100 KB scaffolds. I'll catch up with you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.